Okay, hello everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Josef Hori and we, I will try to get real about AI today, together with you. Um, uh, as was said before, just a little introduction. Uh, I am a co-host of a Czech podcast called Canaries in the Net, where we are mostly warning uh, about uh, negative impacts of the technology. So we are doomsayers in our podcast, and I will be a bit of a doomsayer today as well. Uh, but there will be some positive stuff as well. And I have had, I have been having the honor to uh, give lectures at the Czech Technical University, uh, giving a lecture called Hacking the Mind, which is about a broader topic of digital manipulation, uh, basically how digital technologies and information space shape our society, our brains, etc., etc. Um, now. Let's start with the existential risk. So, most of you have probably noticed in the media since ChatGPT came out earlier this year or in the end of next, uh, last year, you know, you, you may have noticed all the weird articles uh, warning us against robots taking over, uh, rep AI representing an existential risk. By existential risk, what is meant is that it will soon have a capacity apparently to wipe out all humanity. There, will, there were different uh, public letters, uh, like, like this one from the Future of Life Institute, which immediately or quite soon after ChatGPT came out earlier this year, uh, asked to pause all AI experiments, uh, sit, at, sit around the table and talk about regulations and other stuff. Uh, there was another sort of a open letter, if you will, although it was just this one sentence which said, which was released by the Center for AI Safety and which said that mitigating the risk of, our, of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. This one was also signed by some high profile people in the industry, including Sam Altman, CEO of, of OpenAI. We will get to them later. And last but not least, quite famous article by Eliza Rudkowski uh, in magazine Time, who was arguing that it's not only, it's not enough to pause the experiments. We should hold them all together. And if someone would be training advanced AI models, then United Nations should bomb the data center. That was written in that Time magazine piece. So this really weird narrative inspired partially by sci-fi, uh, sort of entered our public sphere and influenced, uh, you know, the broader public. Uh, we will not be talking about this type of techno-occultism today. We will be talking about AI, what it, is, what it really is, because all these statements, maybe not originally, maybe it was not the intent, but then what they, what they, what they have been causing in the public sphere was sort of a, a, a basically, you know, making people scared, etc. So let's get real. Most of you probably remember several years ago, there was this meme running around the internet when cloud computing was getting big, everyone and everything was mo being moved to the cloud, enterprises were adopting cloud strategies, etc. So there was this, this meme saying that basically cloud is just someone else's computer, that is just the code basically running on someone else's computer, which cloud clearly is, right? And this applies also to AI. This doesn't apply to cloud only, right? We can say this safely about AI. There is this, so AI is nothing magical. It's a code. It's a piece of software, however, un, however unconventional, however new, because it's not programmed based on rules, but it's basically being trained on large amounts of data. We will get back to, we will get back to that later. And there is this awesome site, which is like three or maybe four years old, called Anatomy of AI, Anatomy of AI. You can check it out. And what it, what it depicts, what it shows, is basically uh, how difficult or how complex an AI system is. In this particular case, it shows the AI system, system called Alexa from Amazon. You know the little puck, the little smart speaker, right? And so there is like this huge PDF. You can, you can zoom into it and you can check 
individual pieces and individual complexities of that little puck, which then can tell you what weather will be tomorrow or, or order a food or pizza or something, right? Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are real complexities. AI is nothing etheric. It's nothing, you know, coming from the blue sky. It's very much grounded and it sits on top of global supply chains and global geopolitical tensions and, and, and geopolitics as such. So it all starts as an example with rare earth elements, right? Because in order for, for us to have AI, we need to have chips. And in order for us to have chips, we need to get some really precious metals. And most of these metals are being mined in unstable regimes, in unstable countries, in Africa, etc., etc. So there you have it, right? Nothing, nothing etheric there. This is real supply chain geopolitical issue. Then if you move up the stack a bit and you need the AI to start working, you need huge global communication infrastructure. So we basically need a submarine cable infrastructure until Elon Musk builds this, his whole Starlink, which he will be turning on and off at will anyway. But so, and there is like 900,000 kilometers of that infrastructure. So this is huge, right? And it's a critical infrastructure, by the way. And we have seen in relationship to uh, last year, uh, to, to the Ukrainian conflict, to the war in Ukraine, Russia's aggression in Ukraine, we have seen the Nord Stream pipeline being blown up, right? This will be the target as well very soon. This is a critical infrastructure which we should protect. And this is AI. These are the veins through which the blood, through which the, the information, the data, for the AI flows. And then, as I said, AI is not a program which someone just sits down and writes. It's sort of a simulation, they say, of a, of a human brain or whatever, but it needs a huge amounts of data to train. So there is a training phase. And where do you get those data? Well, you scrape something from the internet, but then you need also quite a lot of people, quite a huge la manual labor to clean up and label those data. Because you just cannot take any data and just throw them in, right? You need to understand what those data are about. So you need people to tag them, to label them, to analyze them, and to process them. And this is again done usually in the third countries, in the development wor developing world countries, Philippines, India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So again, real geopolitical impacts. And then you need a huge amount of compute, basically servers, server farms, cloud, cloud infrastructure. And that, again, requires a lot of manual labor. It requires co-location, let's say, near you know, electrical plant, because you need to generate, you need to consume a lot of electricity. So now there are talks that for, in order to train the next generation of AI, we will need really to speed up the development of nuclear, modular nuclear reactors, right? Because best way to do, to, you know, sort of, satisfy the, the energy demand will be through nuclear potentially for the AI because it's stable, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, okay, so it's real. It's a code and it has huge geopolitical consequences. I didn't talk about the chips. There is now shortage of chips and there is only there, are, there is maybe one or two companies which can develop those chips and that's a choke point in further development of AI and also a source of power right because who decides who will get the chips based on what criteria right so that this will solidify the the existing power structures we will get back to that as well now we are talking about generative ai we sort of all know what it is because everyone probably has played with with uh, with the chat gpt and other systems but it's uh, interesting to look at it through the lens of uh, the traditional, analytical, narrow AI, which we used to have, or still have, but which was with us, which has been with us since 2011 at least, or even decades before. So the traditional AI, in terms of machine learning, would, be, would have really narrow purpose, right? So, and would be built usually for data analysis or, you know, pattern, pattern uh, matching, uh, predictions, etc. All, all basically about pattern matching. Now, this generative AI can do new information. This is for the first time when sort of the machine can invent new information which makes sense for us people. So this is what is, what is new about it. Now, the training part is important, right? So the traditional AI would, you know, you would need to get the specialized data fit for purpose. 
Here you need a vast amount, wide variety of data, general data sets. They say basically the whole internet, and that's what also happened. They trained it on the whole internet. Now, it, the way how we interact with the system change is changing as well, right? So, so far, if you are decision, if you are a decision maker, you would already have a, a, a dashboard or. All of us have in our pockets these phones which can recognize you know, uh, objects on, on photos, etc. So this is the fit for purpose. This is the narrow type of paradigm, interaction paradigm, where we are interacting with the model just within the context of, of the given application or of, of the given, uh, uh, given context. And in the, in the generative AI world, we are using natural language and it works with rich context. So we, the more context we provide it, the better the answer uh, should be and, and usually is. And as for the application, that sort of relates to the purpose. So obviously, additional, uh, the traditional AI, as, I'm, as I am calling it, would be text analysis, image recognition, pattern matching, and all that stuff. Here, we can generate pretty much any information, right? Right now, it's not only about language or images. It's starting to be about video as well. Next year, there will be uh, a full-featured movie, apparently, uh, premiered uh, sci-fi movie. I have seen the trailer. It's not moving yet properly, but uh, hopefully, maybe they will get there. And uh, it also cannot just you know, generate stuff, but also explain existing stuff. So it can help us to orient ourselves in vast amounts of data which we are, and information which we are facing on a daily basis. OK, so this is the comparison, like what, what is new, what is different. Now. What is it really, right? We are all asking, we are maybe interacting with ChatGPT or DALI as a you know, image generator and other, other systems, but we don't really know how they work. And it's not just us, but even those guys who, build, who are building those systems don't really know how they work. And they, have been quite, they were quite surprised when they trained the latest versions, how capable they are. Uh, however, what we know, and what is clear that it's becoming something what is called general purpose, te purpose technology. General purpose technology is a technology which will eventually go through and be adopted by different areas of our, of our activities, of different industries, different areas of our lives, and it will change them more or less to a bigger or lesser extent, but it will change them. Fire was, uh, is a type of a general purpose technology. Before we had a fire, before we could control it as a humankind, we would be living very, very much differently. Once we adopted it, we didn't just warm ourselves food for dinner, but uh, we also started to do metallurgy and other stuff. Similarly, electricity, right? That was like the, the last biggest uh, industrial revolution, apparently. So again, changing everything from lives of common people to industrial, logistical, and other processes. Now, each one of us can control fire, usually, and electricity as well, right? So it, it really became part of our daily lives. Uh, and how it works, how AI works, this generative, this new one, well, so what we know is that basically uh, all the data which companies like OpenAI and others could get their hands on, put their hands on, were scraped, put together, and run through uh, an advanced or modern uh, architecture based on deep neural networks with some twists in terms of transformers, etc., which is the technology stuff. But we, you can imagine it as a, what is inside, as a hyperconnected space of words. By hyperconnected, I mean there are different paths and different connections between individual words or their, pa or their parts in the system. And so then, when the system is generating the response based on what you wrote it, based on the prompt which you gave it, it sort of seeks the path in this hyperdimensional system. We talk about billions of parameters, which are basically weights, weights in the neural network which is uh, from which the, based on which the system is built on. So, and, and there are like hundreds of billions of parameters. So th they would need like billions and tens of billions of pieces of text to feed it in and to build this space, this unimaginable sort of a cloud of words, and one could argue of all human knowledge. 
Uh, and as Stephen Wolfram, one of the smartest guys alive uh, and very, very, uh, very, very productive guy, inventor of mathematica and other, other, other stuff, said we are not really able to empirically uh, sort of prove why it is doing what it is doing. There are now huge efforts in OpenAI and other companies in the domain of interpretability. Basically, having the ability to look into the neural network, into the system, and say what is going on there, where are the facts which is throwing, why is it throwing, why is it returning what it's returning, etc. We are not there yet. Now billions of dollars are being thrown at, into that, at that problem. So one can say that we as humankind have stumbled upon generative AI sort of accidentally, right? We have scaled up compute, we have thrown a lot of data into it, and suddenly it's a bit, it's, it's a magic. So we are, so no wonder that there are these, uh, you know, there were these open letters and other stuff which I spoke about in the beginning. Now, what is interesting that you can uh, sort of add to that space not only text, but also interpretation of images, audio, uh, video, and etc. And there is this interesting and, and very cool project, which I personally very much love, called Earth Species Project, which tries to take, and quite successfully to be honest, LLM, large language models, that architecture which I spoke about, and they, they are not throwing in human data, but they are throwing in voices, noises, gestures, and other expressions of animals, trying to understand how animals talk, and hoping that very soon we will be able to talk to animals. Right? So interpreting uh, how animals interact. You know, because it's not only about noises, it's about other stuff, it's about other types of expressions like gestures, uh, uh, you know, like how, how they behave in a, in a group, etc., etc. So that's sort of mind-blowing uh, mind uh, application of LLMs, apart from all the other stuff which, which uh, we are somehow aware of. Uh, some people call these systems stochastic parrots, meaning that since they have been trained on our data, they most likely cannot produce anything else, and there is some uh, probabilistic model. They always give you something a bit different based on your prompt. If you try to run the same prompt several times, then you always get something a bit different. That's because the space which I spoke about, the interconnections between words, and then the paths, the, 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 the ways how, how how the, how the engine iterates through that space is based on probabilities, right? So, so that's why stochastic parrots. And, and this probabilistic nature of that space leads to something what is called hallucinations, which is one of the biggest drawbacks of the current systems. You may have, you may have encountered them, right? You ask, it, you ask the system, let's say ChatGPT or other, for a certain answer, you even give it a document, like you know, the new startup Vector did, and they have published the hallucination index of, the, of all the major of all the major models. And uh, there are facts. So basically, what they have tried to do here, they try to ask back for the facts, and they they found out that with different rates, these models are hallucinating, meaning inventing the facts, disinterpreting them, omitting them, etc., etc. And this is the ratio. So GPT-4 apparently has hallucination rate 3.0%, while Google Palm has 12.1%. So he, we have to be very much aware of this, because once you deploy the system into some critical application where you need a high degree of reliability, then it's a big question how much hallucination you can afford. Right? Similarly, when we are deploying these systems to educational domains, like to schools, universities, etc., we should always sort of marry that with uh, teaching students to validate facts and not to trust the system 100%. Because hallucination seems to be an inherent problem uh, given the probabilistic nature of the system. Another aspect which is interesting is something called emergent behaviors. So, 
as all those data were thrown into the system, and it has built it, its internal probabilistic hyperconnected space of all words, etc. Suddenly, we, the developers, the creators of the system, and all of us, were surprised that it can do stuff which we didn't expect. It suddenly can uh, pretty much translate between any language. It suddenly can simulate different people. Suddenly, it can even invent its own new language. There is a uh, nice prompt where you can even ask it to turn the prompt which you are giving it into its own internal language, which is basically a compression, and then you ask it in an, another chat to decompress it, and it does it very well. So there are like all these emergent behaviors, and some of them can be risky, right? Suddenly, if we teach it chemistry, we are not just teaching it the high school chemistry or university level chemistry, but suddenly we are teaching it also potentially the bioweapons development, right? And it's, it's very hard to sort of take care of that, right? So, so what companies are doing, uh, how, how they are coping with these emergent behaviors is that they are basically fine-tuning the model to, if you ask it, give me a, a, a recipe for a bioweapon, then it will refuse to do that. The same for hate speech, for anti-Semitic speech, etc., etc. Uh, so, so, but the question is whether this is enough, because then, on the other hand, on, in parallel to that, on the internet, everything is on the internet, so in parallel you have, you have uh, jailbreak efforts, right, where people, communities, are figuring out how to, how to break through these safety measures which were fine-tuned in by the company. So, so company releases a model, thinks it's safe, that it cannot be used for you know, racist stuff or you know, bioterrorism or whatever, and then, uh, one co then communities try to find sort of a, you know, hacking it, but not, they are not hacking it in a way that you know, they would be sitting and writing scripts and trying to connect to ports and hacking into the system. They are actually doing social engineering on that, on that system, trying to convince it to give them the information which they are looking for, like the recipe for bioweapon. Because the information is still there, the system just, is just trained not to provide it to anyone. And that's, that's clearly uh, sometimes doesn't work well. So these are emergent behaviors, something to be very much, uh, very much uh, cautious about. And that's why, in terms of regulation, we need constant, we need high level of transparency, which we will be talking about as well, but high level of transparency and iterative oversight, basically institutions, humans in the loop continuously. OpenAI and other companies seem to be doing that, but the question is, whether we can delegate this responsibility to self-regulation fully. Now, in the industry, the holy grail, you may be asking why are they building this and in parallel releasing open letters to stop the development. It doesn't make sense, right? The motivation for the whole industry is to achieve something what is called AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, which is sort of a holy grail for them again. And OpenAI in their charter and other companies have similar definitions. Uh, so OpenAI is defining it autonomous, that AGI is an autonomous system that surpasses human capabilities in the majority of economically valuable tasks. So there is a money incentive in there because you have economy, you have economically valuable tasks. It's not clear whether AGI system has to know has to be empathetic, because we cannot even, uh, uh, cannot even quantify what does it mean, right? Uh, it probably can simulate empathy and understanding and, 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 and social relationships, etc. But this is about uh, economically valuable tasks. And quite coincidentally, just a couple of days, or maybe one week or two weeks ago, uh, DeepMind, a subsidiary of Google or Alphabet, they have released a new paper which, is, which basically quantifies a path towards AGI, how they see it, and they are using pretty much very similar, very similar uh, definition as OpenAI does. And they are looking at AGI as a general intelligence which will surpass us in all or most or majority of economically valuable tasks. So they are looking at it through this matrix where basically you have performance, 
So they have different levels of performance, like emerging, competent, expert, and then superhuman, and then generality, right? So generality is basically similar to what I was talking about earlier, the analytical AI and the generative AI. And uh, so they have these levels, and they are giving examples of different systems. As an example, they are stating that right now we have a superhuman narrow AI, which is, as an example, AlphaFold, which coincidentally was built by DeepMind, uh, which is able to predict structures of proteins much better. Actually, humans cannot do it at all, so it can do something what we cannot do at all. Similarly, you have uh, in the virtuoso space uh, level, you have AlphaGo, which is the famous system which, which uh, have beaten the world champion six, seven years ago, I believe. The world champion in, in the Go game, which is like the, you know, one of the most complex uh, uh, open games we know. And quite interestingly, right now in the generative or in the general space, in the generative space, we are still in the emerging, uh, on the emerging level. So we have GPT, Bart, Lama, Dali, or whatever, but mostly the, the text uh, generators. And then in the second part of the paper, what they are doing, they are basically classifying autonomy levels. So you have these performance levels, right? Expert, virtuoso, superhuman, etc. And then they are saying, risk will change depending on the level of autonomy which the AI system will have. And the smarter it will be, the more autonomy it will have. That's what they are arguing. So as an example, in the, on the emerging level, they are saying here, you know, AI will, is a tool, right? So you have some software, rule-based system, which helps unskilled humans to do stuff which they, which they cannot do. And it, as a risk, they are saying that uh, it basically, you know, pushes people to the skill. So basically, people may be losing some skills or not acquiring certain skills so quickly, etc. And then, of course, as every technology, it can disrupt established uh, industries. Now, uh, for the AI as a consultant, that's where ChatGPT comes into play. Uh, we are, I spoke about the hallucination. They are saying that one of the biggest risk is, risks is overtrust. So we should be cautious with trusting those systems. And it can help and lead to radicalization and targeted manipulation. And I want to get, get, get back to that in a bit. And then they go through you know, these different levels of autonomy, AI as a collaborator. So when you have AI as a collaborator, then there comes the question of you know, people losing jobs. Uh, this, is, this graph which, we are sh which I'm showing here comes from Goldman Sachs analysis from, the, uh, from earlier this year, from the first half of this year, where they took the taxonomy of, of labor, basically, from, from, uh, from National uh, Statistical Bureau in the United States, however it's called, and they, they estimated the impact which this new generative AI technology will have on that, on that particular industry. And you see that basically for all the industries, it's 25%, but when you enter information-based industries, when you leave the domain of, of the manual industries where we are actually operating with the matter, where we are moving atoms, once we are somehow moving bits, then the impact seems, uh, is expected to be quite large. And how quickly this impact will be realized is hard to predict. Established theory of technology adoption is saying that usually it takes 50% adoption in the industry for the productivity gains to kick in and for the productivity increase to kick in. This happened with electricity, with electricity when we were transitioning from steam power to the electric power. It took approximately 20 years maybe 30, but it definitely needed a bigger adoption before the productivity uh, gain kicked in because we need to change the way how we work, the ways of working. We need to change the culture, reskill people, retrain them, do all the transformation programs in corporations, etc., etc. So it's hard to say whether it's going to be 10 years, 15 years, 5 years, but what is important is the adoption and OpenAI and other companies are pushing the adoption forward quite, quite, uh, quite successfully. So far, ChatGPT, I believe, has over 100 million users already. Now, another paper which, is, which came out this summer from 
a bunch of universities who collaborated with, uh, which collaborated with uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group. So basically they were, they, they were doing a research on their consultants, on 750 or something like that consultants, where they had a control group working in the old way, and then uh, two other groups working with AI, with ChatGPT, and it, it came out, there are some uh, interesting findings in there, but one of the most interesting one is that those who work with AI have seen productivity gains, meaning productivity as a pace, so they were you know, quicker, and also gains in quality of output. We are talking about consultants, business consultants, right? Producing different information assets for their clients, strategies, presentations, recommendations, and all that stuff. So everyone have, has seen increase in the quality of their work, but what, what was interesting that those who were high-skilled before, before using AI has seen smaller gains than lower-skilled participants in the research. So basically what it means is that uh, you know, th those who are lower-skilled, who, who are maybe like worse workers, will have higher gains from AI and it will move them to pretty good, to, onto a pretty good enough level, if you will. And what will happen then when everyone is pretty good, right? Suddenly, we will need to recali recalibrate, sorry, recalibrate our uh, qualitative measures, our tests and evaluations and all that stuff. And as famous saying goes, uh, AI will, so what this means is that basically AI will not, will not replace you, but those who are using it will. And by the way, this image is AI generated and you can recognize it because there is a typo somewhere. Oh, I have fixed, uh, did I fix it? Or maybe someone has six. I will not release you, yes, 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 yes. This is not the only one uh, generated here, you will see that. Just pay attention and try to find the flaws, the hallucinations. Uh, so, and then, then we have AI as an expert, so, you know, that's like mass labor displacement, decline in human exceptionalism, suddenly we will realize that we are not the smartest intelligences in the known universe, etc. And then, final frontier is the AGI, which is AI as autonomous agent. So basically, that's AI which is acting in the environment, in different environments, learning, acquiring metacognition skills, meaning learning new stuff, picking its own goals, etc., etc. And there is a huge question for regulators and policymakers, how are we going to deal with such a system? And actually, how are we going to deal with such a system? We can learn from the past. Because one can argue that we already have an autonomous agent deployed to divide society, and that's social media. It's not the general AI, it's the narrow one. And we have been interfacing and interacting with it on a population level for the last 15 years almost. So this was social media, one can argue, have been the first society's first contact with, with true AI, with this autonomous level AI. However narrow, but the narrowness may be also part of the problem. So you may have seen the, the, the movie Social Dilemma on Netflix, which, which was on the previous slide. So, and, and as they are stating in, in, in that, uh, in, you know, the deep mind in the table, there are like two fundamental risks. One is concentration of power. And we have seen this with social media, right? So social media, when you look on the statistics, how the consumption you know, uh, habits change. We, most of us have stopped to pay attention to the traditional media, meaning TV, radio, newspapers. Newspapers are dying. There will be a bunch of people who are still ordering the pieces of paper with, you know, with, with the ink on that. But most of the information which we are consuming uh, comes, through, comes from the internet and is recommended to us through recommendation algorithms, through social media algorithms, through information platform algorithms. And so what these media, what these AIs, narrow AIs, actually have, they have power over our perception, because perception is reality, and they are telling us what to think about the reality. They are telling us what to think about pandemics, we have seen that, what to think about the Ukrainian conflict, what to think about Israel-Palestine Israel conflict, and other, you know, things, phenomena which are happening. One can argue that Mark Zuckerberg is one of the most powerful men emperors in the history. When you look up on Wikipedia, the most powerful emperors in history 
then he is, I think, like number four in terms of portion of actual population he has influence over. And this is not, this is not like Coca-Cola that we drink their sugar or something. This is, we are spending hours with algorithm every day, a lot of us on a monthly basis, uh, spending hours a day with, with content provided by this algorithm. It's not only Facebook, it's also Instagram as an example, right? Similarly, then we have Google, YouTube, and then we have Chinese government deploying TikTok into our information sphere. However, they are saying that they, are, they have nothing to do with Chinese government. Uh, and then it, it gets even weirder. <laughs> then you have Edison of our times who bought Twitter, and suddenly you see spike 10 times 15 times spike in anti-Semitism, racism, misogyny, and, and, and uh, hate speech and other stuff. And I'm not talking about calling someone idiot, but I'm talking about, uh, you know, messages which ask for violence, which are trying to radicalize people to, you know, commit genocide against a certain group of people, LGBTQ, etc., etc. Right? So, true chaos agent, however a genius entrepreneur he may be. So concentration of, of power is there. We, are, we have basically people who, who are controlling it, who are responsible for it. Musk has bought Twitter and turned it private, so he is owning it together with Saudis and Chinese and other people. And then uh, Zuckerberg, is, Facebook is, is publicly traded, or Meta is publicly traded corporation, but there is a dual class share system. So. It's not like in the traditional corporations where the board of directors appoints or, uh, you know, the, the, the demotes the CEO, but it's the other way around, actually, in Facebook. Uh, and as Economist in 2017 said, the world's most valuable resource is not all about data, and these new generative AI systems are just continuing in that, right? So social media were all about something what Shoshana Zubov in her, you know, famous book, five years old book, uh, the age of surveillance capitalism calls extraction imperative, which is basically the driving imperative of business operations for all these companies. Opportunistically gather as much data as possible, and we will see later, because the hope is that the more data you have, the better models you will be able to build in the future, which is proven to be true, especially these days, when you need huge amounts of data to build uh, these generative AI systems. And related to the data question, uh, since generative AIs have been, are being trained from the whole internet, there is a legitimate question, what about copyright, right? They are uh, s hiding themselves, companies like OpenAI, others, uh, underneath or behind something what they call fair use policy, that they can scrape data, analyze them, and they are saying that that's what they are doing. However, it's, uh, we will see a lot of lawsuits in there, and they are expecting it because Sam Altman in the, at the last DEF conference one or two weeks ago has promised all their clients, uh, you know, uh, basically legal, legal shield against copyright claims. So if you are using ChatGPT and you are facing copyright lawsuit, then they will pay for it. So obviously they are aware that this is coming. And now as for the power, we are talking about foundational models. Foundational models, you know, GPT, Palm, Bard, others, these are models which then will hold ecosystem of other different applications for educational, medical, and other purposes. And we see already Cambrian explosion of AIs, basically, of different systems which are, which are being adopted, how the general purpose technology is being adopted in our, in our domain. And Stanford has started to do uh, an interesting ecosystem graph where, which you can navigate and see the interdependencies between individual models applications, data sources, etc. So this provides sort of a holistic view of the current major platforms, models, etc. And, and, uh, and you can see the sources or, you know, hubs of power, concentration of power in there. And last but not least, there is a big question around openness transpa and transparency and closeness, right? So although company like OpenAI is calling themselves open, they are keeping their model closed. No one knows what is going on behind the curtain. And, but there are like other open source or more open initiatives, like Meta is releasing their Lama 2 model, 
not completely open source, but in a pretty open manner, so anyone can use it. And this will lead to further proliferation of the technology and adoption. So basically, the technology will get commoditized, right? So we all will be building, and different people will be building different systems on top of Lama 2 and other systems. And now, just very quickly back to when we are talking about the power, I was really asking myself why this one sentence statement came out and why it was signed by the very people who are actually building those systems. Since I've been running a podcast about propaganda, apart from other things, uh, when you look onto this sentence, you see three very heavily loaded words in there. Extinction, pandemics, and nuclear war. Whenever you put this into a headline, then you get a clickbait and you, you, you know, you, your, your, numbers, your numbers skyrocket. So this is a manipulative statement, purely manipulative statement, and it's probably on purpose. And one can argue why, what is the purpose? Well, it's to get the attention. So as propagandists know, every good populist who is using such emotional statements of threat, fear, I will protect you, first needs to scare you in order to protect you then. So this is what, what actually has been happening, right? So after releasing all these statements, signing them, they gained the, the seat at the, at the negotiation table with the lawmakers in the United States. This is from a closed session, bipartisan session uh, in the US Senate, where you had all the big names, all the big shots in one place, around $3 trillion worth of capital, sitting in that room, talking about regulation. I will leave it to your imagination how it went. So this is called regulatory capture. G getting regulation set up in a way which suits me as an inc incumbent in the market. That's a business terminology. And if, if you are releasing such, such statements, then <laughs> I don't know what else are you aiming for the regulatory capture. And actually, there is a proof that after the European Union quite, quite, quite quickly re, uh, reacted to generative AI and added an appendix to AI Act, which has been in the making for the last three or four years, which actually covers generative AI. And it's asking exactly the questions like, what about cooperated material, which went, went, which went to the training? Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Altman uh, said at the press conference that if the regulation will look like this, that the open AI will have to you know, uh, go away from the European market. But two days later, probably after consulting Microsoft, uh, he met with uh, Van, uh, von der Leyen and uh, stated that he is looking forward to a fruitful co uh, cooperation. So uh, another term, and, and I need to ask, how much time do I have? I don't have time, or do I? Do I? OK. Another term which is worth mentioning, and I will try to be, be quicker, is called misalignment. So this is a term in AI safety community, and it basically means making sure that the AI system follows the goals and objectives which are in alignment with us as people. So it doesn't go Skynet or Terminator against us or HAL 9000. Basically, alignment in AI is about making sure that HAL 9000 always opens up the port doors, port bay doors, if you have seen the Space Odyssey 2001. Uh, now, when talking about the social media algorithms, this is exactly the example of AI system which is hugely misaligned because it focuses on our attention. It's like a tabloid. In the traditional media, the, the, the equivalent of current social media is a tabloid. This has, been, this has been proven, right? It tries to gather as much of your behavioral data as possible to give you and gives you some personalized news feed, something which what could interest you, basically, to get as much attention of your attention as possible. Reed Hastings, uh, uh, boss, uh, CEO of Netflix, four or five years ago said, uh, our biggest enemy is not HBO or Amazon Prime or other, you know, video on demand networks. Our biggest enemy is sleep, because that's when we cannot touch your attention yet, until Elon Musk uh, finishes his Neuralink project. So, so and, and this is a problem, because we, we are living in a democracy, and we hope to sustain it through this era of rapid change. Yet we have a 
information sphere privatized, that's what we spoke about in the conservation of power part, and set up incorrectly. Because you cannot run elections and democratic processes on tabloids, although we are partially doing it. But you need some factual anchors in the information space. You need a system, we need a system, information space to be set, reset and set up in a way where instead of polarizing up, polarizing us, it would, it would unite us and, and help us find consensus. Uh, I'll skip these and I will finish with one statement, basically, where... <laughs> much longer. <laughs> this was interesting stuff, but I, I, I put too, too much in it, into it. Uh, basically, there seems to be a perfect storm right now, which is not perfect for us, but from the meteorological perspective, it's perfect. We have this, this unification of generative AI and attention-optimizing AI. So anyone will be able to generate any type of content which is completely believable, which is completely, you will not be able to uh, you know, distinguish it from, from the reality. This picture which my colleague will be talking about later, this, guy, this little guy from, from Palestine, Palestine was generated because he has six fingers, obviously, right? But soon enough, it will not have six fingers. So soon enough, you will be radicalized one way or the other. You will not be able to distinguish, you know, between what is true and what is not. And it will be engineered in a way to raise as much as of our emotions as possible because it's, that's how it's set up, right? It's set up in a way that most, most emotional uh, content propagates uh, the best and, and the most quickly. So this is the perfect storm. And I will close up here, and I will be happy to discuss it later or, or offline or, you know, any time in the future, that uh, we need actually uh, a better algorithm. Our information space needs a better algorithm. This is one way of fixing and preparing for the AI world. We cannot afford to live in this and, and to stay in this, in, this, in this way of living where information space is privatized, and it's not based on facts and it's not seeking consensus because democracy, the core purpose of democracy is finding consensus. If we don't find consensus of staff, on staff, then democracy doesn't work. It's about compromise, but it's about finding consensus. And it's very difficult in this environment and it will be even more difficult once the generative AI gets fully adopted by everyone and once we get completely confused on what is real and, and emotionally charged by generated content. Thank you very much.